Oh. Welcome everyone. Uh, happy Children's Environmental Health Day. I'm Leila McCurdy. I am a board member of Children's Environmental Health Network, and I will serve as the moderator for today's panel discussion, teaching youth about climate change and health. We have a fantastic panel of speakers. Dr. Samantha Ahud is a pediatrician and founder of Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action. Dr. Megan Lashaw is an associate scientist at Bloomberg School of Public Health at John Hopkins University. Reverend Dr. Olivia Bryan Undergrow is a minister with ministries across generations and a pastor at Independence Christian Church. And Ms. Ria Goswami is a high school senior and is the co-founder and executive director of Environmental Justice Coalition. Climate change is the greatest threat to public health. Children are particularly vulnerable to the physical and mental health impacts of climate change. Children from poor families and from communities of color are even more vulnerable. We all need to work together to prevent climate change and its impacts on health. And education is the first step in that effort. During this panel discussion, our panelists will discuss the importance of educating children about the human health impacts of climate change and um, talk about the gaps in education. They will share approaches used by trusted leaders with diverse expertise and backgrounds, highlighting successes and lessons learned. And they will share tips and resources for educating youth on climate and health. Now I would like to invite our panelists to make brief remarks about their work to educate youth on climate change. After that, we will have a discussion with the panelists uh, where we will explore the topic in more depth. And if I may invite Dr. Uh, Samantha Ahut uh, to um, make her remarks, and then we'll take turns um, with the other panelists. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Layla. It's my pleasure to be here talking with uh, you all today as part of this panel. I wanted to touch a little bit today about um, mental health, children's mental health and climate change. And I think for too long, we've been telling kids that they will be responsible for solving climate change, um, that, and that not us. And that as they're looking at the world changing, um, they see that we haven't instituted real solutions. And I think this is what's led in large part um, to their tremendous anxiety, the tremendous mental health effects, including anger, which uh, is disrupting a lot of trust in our youth government, in our society, and in their quality of life. And to protect kids' mental health, not to mention their physical health and safety, we need to demonstrate our commitment to solutions and talk about these solutions and really shift the conversation away uh, towards what we're doing to protect children. Our, our kids need our action. They need to see that we love them, that we care for them. And that's why we are working to protect them because that's what adults are supposed to do. And that's what makes kids feel safe. So as a pediatrician, I really look for the opportunities to talk to kids about what we are doing to protect them. And I can say that proudly uh, as a physician in Virginia, about what I'm doing personally, what clinicians are doing, Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action, and also practical things I always incorporate about how to keep kids safe in, the, in our changing world. Um, for example, I always talk with families and children about how to stay safe from warmer summers, about steps that they can take so that they can remain active um, and, and healthy um, in the warming temperatures. So bottom line is, I think that in order for our children to support their mental health, support their trust in us as an adults and their trust in me as their pediatrician, uh, demonstrating our commitment to solutions uh, is a great step. Thank you so much. 
Dr. Rahu, that's a really great way uh, to start our panel discussion, uh, and uh, you described it so well. And now I would like to ask uh, Dr. Lashaw uh, to talk about her activities uh, regarding uh, educating children and her insights. Thank you. Sure. So, um, I am very active, as you, those on the panel know, with the American Public Health Association and our environment section several years ago saw a couple articles that really got us talking about the fact that um, I think the statistic was that most teachers don't teach climate change, um, but four and five parents wished that they did four and five parents wished that teachers would teach climate change and so um from that statistic we started talking about well we're the environmental section at the american public health association what can we do to help teach about climate change um and so we started to dig around to see if somebody had already invented or created some sort of tool on how to teach uh, climate and change, but also because we're the public health and the American Public Health Association, we didn't want to just teach about climate change. We wanted to teach about the health impacts of climate change, um, and so we we found only one real curriculum or lesson planning toolkit from the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences. And we decided to use those materials, but we adapted them to our audience because they were created for teachers. And so they were very um, much adapted to their perspective. And we had, we changed them to be a little bit more adapted for public health professionals. Um, and so we've been working on planning on how we can roll this out and how we can get people to use this tool um, in the classroom. And I'm hoping to talk a little bit about that more um, as we dig a little deeper into the session. Thank you so much, uh, Megan. Uh, yes, as a member of the American Public Health Association, I'm really proud of all the work that is going on there, um, you know, on climate uh, change and health. And as the uh, Children's Environmental Health Committee of the American Public Health Association, uh, we have been very also active specifically targeting um, the education around uh, children's uh, uh, vulnerabilities uh, under the climate change uh, that is really haunting us. And we have put out our fact sheets and um, are uh, really uh, eager to continue our work uh, with you as well. Uh, I mean, we can do this only if you all work together. And I think this panel is another example of how all of us from different um, professions and you know, different communities possibly, uh, you know, really need to come together if you are going to solve this, uh, you know, huge problem that we are and our children are facing. Uh, with that, um, uh, Dr. Abdegro, if I can ask you to uh, make a few remarks and then we'll go to Ria uh, to hear her perspective about uh, what's going on from, uh, you know, it, 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 we as adults can speak about this and recognize some things, but her views are going to be critically important in this conversation. So uh, Dr. Abdegro, if you could kindly tell us about your wonderful work. Thank you. I'm very humbled to be here. Um, I am I am the pastoral faith representative, which means I come with a very um, different perspective of ways to talk about creation care. Um, but the inter keeps coming back to me, interfaith, the fact that all faiths find creation to be central of God's, God's work or whatever you refer to the divine being as, that everybody is constantly seeking a way of connecting to earth and beyond and understanding those interconnectionness. Um, and a lot of my faith work works with intergenerational, the reality that we have moved to such personal selfishness that so often we're not really able to 
relate to one another. And as I was listening um, to the doctors, the the ongoing realities of society and its individualism is one of the primary reasons that we aren't relational enough to give the support needed. Um, and that so much of our faith in my Christian background is about communion and community. And we've lost that because if we're not in communion with each other, then how can we be in communion with creation? And we are not putting the intersectionality and connecting dots because so many people are feeling so overwhelmed um, and not really prepared to have the difficult conversations that come along all the big things in life. Um, and so I come, I have, a, I have two small children or medium children, I guess they're, and, and we're living through this pandemic and I think of all the things that they're constantly needing to talk about um, so that they're great humans responding to a great human world and responding for us faithfully, but also in a bigger picture way so that we understand that everything is connected. Um, and there are resources and there are different things and every family is different and every experience is different and there's so much, but so much can also be overwhelming. So it's kind of going back and forth between, yes, there are the small things that you can do and that empowers you to know that you can do little things that make a big difference. But we also need to empower them to create the relationships that will respond faithfully to taking care of um, what the divine gave us. And so that is the work that I do to make those connections so that we can both empower ourselves and empower others to all ages and stages. And that way our kids don't feel like it's their responsibility, but it's are reminded it's our responsibility. Um, and there are a lot of different things that we can do where our heart calls us to take care of the earth. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your insights and uh, your voice and your leadership is so critical as we uh, combat uh, climate change and health and all the solutions that we need to get to quickly. Um, and uh, now I would uh, like to turn it over to Ria Goswami. And, uh, you know, we're really eager to hear your perspectives. And clearly you saw some gaps in the ways that adults are approaching this, even though we are all saying that it's our job to protect you all, but we definitely need your leadership. So please tell us your story and what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, so hello everyone. It's an honor to be here as a part of this panel, but my name is Ria Goswami. I am 16 years old and I'm from the Northern Virginia area. I'm also a senior at Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology and the co-founder and the executive director of the Environmental Justice Coalition, which is the first grassroots youth-led movement mobilizing the next generation of activists in the fight for intersectional environmental justice. And our work mainly focuses on uplifting BIPOC and marginalized communities through our focus on political advocacy, policy development, community organization, educational initiatives, and content creations. And essentially we're creating the pipeline for future environmental justice activists, climate scientists, sustainable policymakers, and empathetic leaders. So just some background about the Environmental Justice Coalition. It began in March of 2021, and Natasha and I, were, who's the other co-founder, discovered our shared passion for environmental justice, and we both noticed a lack of youth involvement in the movement and a lack of educational awareness around environmental issues surrounding climate change. So pretty much after a month of planning and many late night Zoom calls, we launched EJC with the goal to move, mobilize youth for the fight for environmental justice. So a lot of our work right now entails policy toolkits, which breaks down congressional legislation, such as a Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act of 2021. We're also working towards creating our first policy, which impacts coastal Virginia. We're also working with the Baltimore Transit Equity Coalition to develop an environmental justice as well as transit equity curriculum for the Baltimore County Public School System. We've worked with the Maryland um, Environmental health rights campaign to help their efforts in trying to get an amendment passed in Maryland to guarantee environmental rights as a human right that's stated in the state constitution. Lastly, we write articles on Medium and create social media posts to really connect with the Gen Z audience as well as break down environmental justice issues and current events. So as a current high school student and a member of Gen Z, one of the biggest gaps that I see is that classes often do not cover the topic of climate change in extensive detail. 
So most students are not able to fully grasp the, understand the extent that which climate change affects our daily life, especially in regards to public health and equity. And that's why it's so important to develop an educational curriculum that allows students to engage and learn with content that teaches them real life skills that they can take into the real world and as change makers to tackle climate change as a whole. And our expertise is being a member of Gen Z. So our work especially focuses on engaging young people and Gen Z within environmental justice. And that's how we bring our personal experiences to the table. And the biggest tip we have to connect with youth is working with them and talking with them directly and to understand what we need in terms of education and what content and resources will be engaging and impactful to them. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much um, for your leadership. Um, you know, so far, as we all recognize, um, if kids were um, educated about this topic, which is of course, if any, uh, education is taking place, it comes from more the environmental side. Now it's being recognized more and more, the health message is crit critically important. But uh, from your perspectives, how does that work uh, in the way that uh, you do your work day to day? Uh, when you bring in health, uh, does that, uh, you know, help you to make the case. Um, maybe, um, you know, I'll uh, pose that to Ria before she jumps off because I know uh, she's very busy with everything that she's doing. So incorporating public health as one of the impacts of climate change makes climate change more tangible to Gen Z especially. And it allows us to see actually the effects play out within our own bodies and the people that we love surround us and especially in our community. And that's why um, the course that I took, for example, at AP Environmental Science is the only environmental science course that's even offered remotely to high school students. And that itself helped me grasp and realize so many different concepts like pollution, what is the science behind pollution? I think there's so many facets, especially with so many students within my high school who are interested in biology, but don't necessarily look into the environmental science. There's so many facets that these students could explore potentially, as well as human health impacts. A lot of students want to become doctors also, and this is one of those ways that doctors help impact students as well as young people. And that's why some of their focus, like as um, Dr. Ahud, as well as Dr. Ladshaw, they both focus on students as well as young people and how their health is impacted by the environment. And just because of that, people often neglect being a pediatrician or even being a doctor. They always look to being a surgeon. I think these are one of the most underrated fields and underappreciated fields as a pediatrician. Thank you so much. Uh, any comments uh, from Dr. Ahud uh, in response to what um, Ria um, laid out as a pediatrician? <laughs> well, I would say you're so right, Ria. You know, as a pediatrician, I, I have, am blessed with meeting with uh, hundreds of families, you know, every month talking with hundreds of families about their family and about their children. And it's a remarkable opportunity to really educate people about those intersections between uh, our environment and our health and some and particularly the changing climate and the health of children. And I find in my practice um, that the best way, the easiest way, and I sometimes find the most effective way to integrate it is just to inform parents and inform kids about how the condition that they're coming to me with is being influenced by the changing climate. For example, um, you know, spring is coming a lot earlier now. So now I have to talk with families in February about preventing the onset of their child's asthma, allergies and allergy induced asthma. So when we have that conversation in February, I'll say, you know, spring is coming earlier now uh, because of the changing climate. And that's why I want you to, to start uh, your allergy prevention medicine now because uh, I don't want you to get caught with an allergy induced asthma attack when you're not prepared. So things like that. Or um, this summer, uh, you know, I had a lot of conversations with the children who are most at risk of heat, a lot of with the parents of newborn babies, for example, about how um, the summers are getting hotter. We have to be more careful about bringing your newborn outside because your, your newborn is less able to metabolize heat, can't sweat as effectively. So really in Virginia, when it's in the 90s, you're better off staying inside. Um, so I, or with my active young kids, particularly uh, football players this summer, as they're getting ready for preseason practice saying, listen, summers are hotter now. You know, it's important that you're more cautious um, that you don't get overheated 
uh, and get sick from the heat. So just those brief, um, just those brief inclusions of what of the reality of our changing world, I think really helps parents and families to understand. Oh, this is part of, um, this is affecting my life now, and not just to make a point, but actually it's important to protect them, right? So it's a, uh, it's a, it's a real issue that we as pediatricians need to be integrating into understanding and integrating into our daily practice. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both so much. So following up on that topic, uh, I want to uh, ask um, Dr. Uh, um, Optigro and Dr. Lasho, from the, your professional um, perspective, through your lens, with your audiences, you know, like in your co communities, Optigro, uh, Dr. Optigro and Dr. Lasho, uh, how can we find ways to get these messages into uh, teaching tools uh, so that we are able to uh, educate the youth. And of course, they can be a very strong voice as we can see here through Ria's uh, messages. So how, again, uh, you know, our role with this panel is really to talk about educating the youth and we heard really wonderful messages and how can we find ways to integrate them and how can we actually get them used maybe and you know you both may have examples so uh, it, whoever wants to jump in first please do well i'll jump in because one of the things we do is we connect those dots so i can promise you after this meeting i will be emailing ria to come talk to the other Gen Zers and the youth and the people who work with them to empower her voice um, and continue to connect those. So that would be one of the first things um, that we always are gonna do. So just know that once you find the movement and the passion and the people, um, that's where you follow your heart. And that's for me as a person of faith, that's where God is. God is in that good stuff and that good movement. So that's where you move. Um, I have to say that where I do a lot of work with youth and children and across the spectrum of all the um, necessary intersectionality of justice and what that looks like on so many different levels that I work alongside some amazing people who do in our denomination what's called Green Chalice. And Green Chalice is a creation care ministry that both connects to the um, needs that are happening within legislation and other conferences and connecting those dots always so that we are responding faithfully to creation care. And I have amazing people who work with them. They also created a camp called Soil, um, and that's actually an intergenerational camp where churches come for a week and have an in immersed experience for creation care and understanding based on where they're being called to move and what they're called to learn. We also have what's called Green Chalice Churches. So we have some churches that have been working with those leaders to become carbon neutral or to figure out the best ways to move forward. Simple things that sometimes include getting rid of bulletins. Hello. Um, you know, and, and just the little changes, but also then the big discussions of well, what's this look like? And then they start moving and helping with more of the justice movements as well as they figure out their place. So it, th there are some great work that I want to lift up my colleagues who do that connect so that they're bigger pictures. But there are also some amazing books and stories and little touches that you can always do with children. I find that all of these at one point can be overwhelming, but if we're doing the little daily touches and little reminders, um, kind of similar to, oh, this is your experience with asthma, spring is coming earlier. That's not overwhelming alongside a big chunk of other things. So um, as a parent who feels very overwhelmed um, right now with everything, as we all do, trying to respond in those little steps and those baby steps that can make a big difference. And Rhea, I'd be interested at some point of also hearing, um, you identify as Gen Z. I have a passion of generational theory, um, but I'm also really fascinated by what the COVID pandemic and how that shifts with your age specifically, because you're almost at the end of Gen Z and the beginning of whatever that next group is gonna be that's so impacted. And so that connection and that response is also fascinating to me as we try to equip 
quality conversation around climate change and all it intersects. Um, Gia, did you want to um, jump in? Or? Yeah, so um, since I have to go because I have school, um, it's, it was very nice to speak on this panel. And of course, thank you, Dr. Ladshaw, and thank you, um, Ms. McCurdy, for inviting me onto this panel. And it's nice to meet you, Dr. Updegrove and Dr. Ahud. And I will be sure to connect with all of you. And yeah, so thank you so much for inviting me to this panel and about the generational theory. I will be reaching out to you about that because of course I have a younger sister who is in the next generation. So I can see a lot of changes within her too. But thank you so much. And if you have any questions about EJC or any of the work we do, please be sure to reach out to me or us. Thank you so much, guys. Bye. Thank you very much for making the time for us. Um, really appreciate it. And you'll be hearing from us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you. So, Layla, did you want me to also tackle that question or did you want to move on? Oh, could you kindly? Yes, you have sure. so much to share, Megan. Please oh, do. Yeah, you know, I think in addition to the work that I mentioned previously that I've been doing with APHA, um, I've also been working with a student at um, Hopkins uh, who's in our Bloomberg American Health Initiative. And she is working to um, try to get climate change incorporated into the a family med medicine residency training program. Um, and uh, so she's doing a survey or hope hopefully doing a survey soon. She um, had to get approval to do the, the research um, to find out barriers. Um, we already know a lot of the barriers. You know, it's it's tough to change as well. And we have all, we've talked about changing medical school curriculum for a long time. So um, I think it's interesting that she's targeting residency. Um, and actually, she even pointed me to a paper um, by Phillips Bourne, who I think is at Harvard's uh, Sea Change in his in that program. Um, they're working, um, or they hope to con they hope to develop a toolkit or some sort of curricular guidelines and resources around climate change, so that other physicians, um, just like Dr. Adut, um, can you know know what to do to talk to their patients, um, and that it's something that they think about as they're as they're meeting with them. Um, I think it's important to you know to to tell our students not just about you know, doing one on one things or sort of like recycling or, you know, composting, because I think we get into this fallacy um, that actually was was from what I've seen driven by industry um, that said, oh, if you're concerned about the environment, you should, you know, do this and you should recycle and we're going to continue to pollute and we're going to continue to make greenhouse gases. And so I think it's really important that we talk to the next generation of students about changing policy and how they can get involved as advocates. And so that's why I really am inspired by Rhea and uh, her co-founder, Natasha, because they're really out there trying to take action. It's, it's not just about education and it's not just about what people can do, but it's about how can we change the way that our policies work. That's so true. Uh, and um, I guess we can also focus a little bit now on um, you know, building on some things that we are, how can we use our power as different professionals to influence schools so that this education starts early? One of the quick, easy answers that comes to my mind is um, APHA's Eco Bookworm Club. Um, which the ECO stands for Early Climate Optimists. Um, I think that's more maybe targeting parents um, who want to sort of read with their children about, you know, climate change. Um, I'll put a link to it in the chat if I don't know if the chat will be recorded, but that's one quick, easy answer. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that my office uh, and P Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action did this year um, is we, we recognize that uh, high school athletes are getting a lot of information about uh, heat safety, but that younger kids really were not, uh, that middle schoolers and even elementary school kids um, are not generally getting a lot of heat safety information. Um, so we created a brochure that was really targeted for families uh, and kids 
with very child-friendly, child-focused um, information about how they could play safely outside with a recognition. Uh, and I think we felt it was very important to tie in there that, that the climate is changing, it's getting warmer. Um, and recognizing that, and therefore this is what you can do. And so we we um, we created this brochure, and it's really lovely. Um, we worked with a, a, a wonderful uh, designer, um, uh, it, which is led by public health um, uh, uh, professionals, uh, Good Stock Consulting. And this uh, infographic we've given out at, at every well check every well visit in our office all summer from age six to 16. And we gave it out to um, four other large pediatric uh, networks so that they were giving it out in Charlottesville and in uh, Roanoke. Um, so I hope that we were able to get information to kids um, through that. And I, I think that there's a lot of pediatricians working in this space right now. You mentioned uh, Dr. Lacha, Dr. Phillipsborn, Becca Phillipsborn, she's doing amazing work um, both to educate uh, pediatricians and residents, med students, but also to create family focused um, materials to help help kids and families understand these intersections in a way that's appropriate for their age um, and that doesn't generate, you know, uh, fear. That's great. We could uh, post that online if we haven't already um, the infographic. That's that sounds really, really helpful. Uh, what about you, Dr. Abdugro? Do you feel like, um, you know, there are things um, the, the faith community can do to influence the schools or educate the kids above and beyond what we had discussed? So I, I've been actually putting my mom hat on primarily as I listen. Um, and I and there may already be that there are so many things to curate. And that's kind of what I'm thinking is there's so much that is out there that people don't really know what to listen to and what not to listen to. Um, but we have an amazing opportunity because of this pandemic, actually, to maybe spend some more time curating what is quality in a way that the school can then we can give things that are curated and quality to the schools. Um, and because things are virtual and online, then all of a sudden schools have platforms that you can add different apps, you can do different things and give different kids access because the world had to go more virtual. We actually have some opportunities to curate and to get into schools and homes a little bit more in ways that help streamline quality um, responses to things. So like I, I'm thinking about a lot of those, um, my, my sister teaches a financial literacy class to fifth graders and it's just one or two weeks, but it, it's something that can then go into the classroom and, and trying to figure out ways because clearly there are gaps and the education system in itself has a lot of problems. So you could say one school does this and one school can't do this, but something the disadvantages of virtual space are also the same things that can be used to our advantages so being proactive in this time to create or curate a way and then connect those so that people know oh professionals have looked at this people have done their research it's age appropriate and now i feel comfortable handing it to my students handing it to my children handing it to my families handing it to my faith communities to then be able to talk about faithfully with a different language. So that's kind of the hat that I'm putting on to figure out how to um, do that. Cause it's those little, like, because there is so much and it is connected, it's finding those little doorways in to have the larger conversation so that you are raising kids who someday uh, and even now can make an impact and understand the impact they're making. Um, and they all have that ability, clearly. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Those are really great insights. Uh, any other thoughts um, as we think about how we can do better um, in uh, teaching climate and health uh, to youth so that they feel empowered and they can really um, find for solutions? Well, I'm very excited about um, 
Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action launched this Virginia Climate and Health Education Collaborative this year. And we had a, an event uh, where we had um, students from uh, format, I think, I don't remember exactly how many, multiple Virginia medical schools, school of pharmacy, school of physicians, assistant training. Um, and it's the enthusiasm for these young tr health trainees of learning about this is, is just really inspiring. Um, and they are really driving the incorporation of this into their education. So just this past a couple months ago, uh, the Shenandoah University Physicians Assistance Program, we worked with them and had an elective on climate and health. And now next year, a group of amazing medical students at University of Virginia helped craft uh, a medical, an elective, which is gonna be its first uh, climate and health elective that we're offering. We are helping them to offer in January at UVA School of Medicine. And just like uh, we've been talking about after at the culmination of the two weeks of this elective is actually gonna be uh, participating in the Virginia General Assembly and participating in advocacy. So really leading this to actionable items that they can do to make a difference, which I think we, we've, as we've discussed, is imperative um, to their sense of agency and, um, and uh, mental health. So I'm really excited uh, and about where uh, the, in, the uh, incorporation of climate climate into health education across uh, schools of health training. You know, our, our goal um, originally was to pilot test this, this lesson plan that I mentioned that we developed for high school students. Of course, the pandemic kind of blew that out of the water. Um, but we're re what we're, what we're going to do is, is we are going to hopefully challenge all APHA members. Now there's, I think, 20,000 APHA members. So there's a lot of them. We're going to challenge all of them to um, reach out to their local high schools and offer to, you know, institute these lesson plans if, if the high school is willing to have them, hopefully during National Public Health Week so that we can kind of, you know, draw attention to it and maybe tweet pictures and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, hopefully if that goes well, then maybe that's something that all sorts of other, you know, organizations and professionals could really adapt or use um, in a similar way. Excellent, thank you so much. That's extremely um, exciting. And um, Dr. Octogro, any uh, thoughts on those two questions? You wanna add anything? I do, I wanna to go to the complete other extreme because I think life is all about balance. So while I think we have great opportunities in um, using the digital world and space, I think our true understanding and spiritual and mental health comes from being outside and being in creation. Um, and that's sacred. And there, for me as a person of faith, I care about God's creation, but I don't do it from a place of stuff. I do it as from a place of rest and Sabbath and, and, and mindfulness. Um, and so that goes back to that mental health and spiritual health aspect of what we're also trying to do. And so I think there is something about getting out in nature and, and and knowing how to talk about it and in a way that celebrates what it is so that you want to do the tough work because the tough work is hard. But how do you find that inner strength and that those inner connections that make you really realize that there is something that we continue to need that only the earth can give us. So I guess I would go back to, you know, that idea of while we need to do the educational piece, we also need to do the mindful and mental and rest piece. And we don't live in a society that knows how to do that either. Um, so the more we can do that, the more we may be able to move back the other way. Thank you. That was really, really helpful. And I'm so glad you brought the, um, you know, nature piece into the conversation because clearly uh, there's an abundance of uh, evidence about the physical and mental uh, health impacts of being outdoors in nature, especially for children. 
Uh, thank you so much. Unless there is uh, something that you want to share, um, I think we will say uh, thank you and close the session. I really, really appreciate your participation and happy Children's Environmental Health Day. Thank you. Happy Children's Environmental Health Day. Happy Children's Environmental